Man, I feel like I have so much to teach you in so little time. I've got this class set up so it's going to cover 16 lessons, and yet I feel like that's not going to be enough. We've, we've gone through nine lessons so far. I feel like we've learned a lot, but man, there's just so much about faith development and so much neat stuff that I just want to pass on to you. But we're going to do the best that we have. I'm Curtis Hartshorn. This is Reaching New Levels of Faith. And we're on class number 10. How do a... I solidify my faith. How does that work out? We've, we've talked about the five different levels of faith. And if you get out your workbook, hopefully you have that by now. And if at all possible, again, I want to remind you, please sit down with a Bible. If that's a possibility for you, you'll get so much more out of that. In the workbook, if you turn to chapter 10, you'll see the verses that we're going to read are actually underlined. And so if you'll be looking those up, the first one's there in John uh, chapter 4, so we'll be there in a little bit. But uh, we're going to talk about how do I solidify my faith. We've talked about the five levels of faith, and those are on the screen right here. Imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, and mature faith. And at this stage in the class, normally people are thinking, okay, I, I get the imitating faith. Yeah, children, they just imitate. Affiliating faith, I can certainly see that, how people just, their faith is just based on who they affiliate with. Searching faith, we understand, yeah, I need to go through that step. And I understand mature faith, that's the goal. But what's this solidifying faith? That just seems like that's jammed in there. Well, I assure you it's not. This is an important step. This next slide that I'm showing you is a picture that I'm very familiar with. It is a work site where they're building a house or some kind of a building here. And I used to work a little bit of construction. And I remember I thought I was pretty decent at putting up a wall until I worked with a guy named Lavoie. Lavoie knew how to make a wall solid. I mean, when he got done with that wall, he knew how to anchor it to the floor and anchor it to the, the ceiling and get it in such a way that not a single board would move. And you could hit it as hard as you want, it seemed like, and there's just no way it was going to move. Solidifying our faith is a process where after a period of searching, and by the way, you will always be searching, but at some point you need to come down solid on what you believe. Okay, I've studied this and studied this and studied this. Do I believe it or not? You come down solid. Let's look at that scripture in John chapter 4 together. And in verse 46, we read that therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water to wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he started off. Now, as he was going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. And he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. And then he said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. And so the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now this man obviously had a, a strong belief to begin with. He had come to, uh, to Cana from Capernaum. That's about 16 and a half miles and remember, he had to walk, and so he had gone a great distance to, to see Jesus. And verse 50 says that when Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives, it says he believed. Pistuo, the Greek word. He believed in God. He had faith that Jesus would heal his son. And yet, after he had inquired when this happened from the slave, and they said, Well, this is when it happened. He realized that's exactly when Jesus did it. 
It says in verse 53, the father knew that this was the hour. And it says he himself believed. Well, I thought he already believed. What happened here? His faith was solidified. He had faith, but now it's solidified. He's like, yes, I believe Jesus. He said, my son's healed. That's good enough for me. I'm going to go home. But when he heard that it actually happened at exactly the same time Jesus said it was going to happen, man, that solidified his faith. And so that's what we're talking about here. How do you solidify your faith? How do you get to that point that your faith comes down solid? For your faith to grow, you need to understand you have to overcome your unbelief in the book of Mark, if you'll turn there with me to chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And let's start reading in verse 14 together. Now, when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and they began running up to greet him, that is, to greet Jesus. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. Notice he didn't bring the son to the disciples. I brought you my son, Jesus. I brought my, my son to you. I brought you my son possessed with a spear, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams into the ground and he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and he stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and he said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. This man, who obviously had enough faith again to bring his son to Jesus, he expected Jesus to heal him. But when he talks to Jesus in verse 22, he expresses some doubt here, but if you can do anything, and Jesus catches on that. He says, if you can, he repeats that to him. It, did you say if you can? Which I, I think that's somewhat comical to think about who he's talking to here and to say, Jesus, well, if you could do something, obviously Jesus can. But as the, as the man states here in verse 24, I do believe, help my unbelief. Man, can you relate to that? It's like, yes, I do believe, but boy, I catch myself sometimes. And like, if you do believe, why didn't you step on in faith in that instance? I do believe, man, I need help with my unbelief. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about solidifying our faith. We do believe, we do have faith. But if you really, if you're at searching faith and you really want to get to mature faith, you need to start making your faith solid. You need to address the areas where you have unbelief. You need to identify those as you're searching out your faith. And I want to repeat again, you will always be searching the rest of your life. I'm not saying that you stop searching. But as you're searching, you need to reach a point where you come down solid on what you believe. Now, how do we do that? In a practical way, how do we make our faith solid? Well, I've got some things in your workbook and, and up here on the screen as well. First of all, you need to A, come to some conclusions. And here's what you need to, to say. Number one, I either believe it or I do not. I'm going to come down solid in this and I've studied this long enough that I need to decide. Do I believe this or do I not believe it? You also, number two, you need to ask yourself, do I accept God's will for my life? 
There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul is talking about a point in his faith, and I believe it's a solidifying point in his faith where he had to come to some conclusions about his life. And that was whether he was going to accept God's will for his life. He describes it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Now concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see what Paul is saying about what happened in his life? He said, I had this thorn in the flesh, and we're not told what it is, and, and that's probably a good thing. We don't know. It's some kind of a physical thing. It's in the flesh. But he says, I prayed three times. God, take this away from me. Take this away from me. Take this away from me. Three times he prayed that. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, Paul, are you willing to accept the position I've placed you in? And we all have to go through that stage in our faith. Are you willing to accept this is God's will for my life? This is where he wants me to be. Now at this point, I want to give you two warnings. First of all, do not set time limits for spiritual growth. As we're talking about you need to reach a point where you solidify your faith, that doesn't mean you're going to set a date and say, okay, this point, I'm going to have solidifying faith, and then I'm going to, uh, a week later, I'm going to have mature faith. <laughs> Physical growth doesn't work that way. Neither does spiritual growth. So don't do that. Don't set time limits for spiritual growth. At the same time, do recognize when it's time to move forward. You'll know. There'll be a time where you can say, I've studied this out. I know the scriptures well. I know what God says about this. It's time. Am I going to come down solid? What am I going to do with this Christianity stuff? Am I going to believe it or not? Am I going to be the man or the woman that God has called me to be? To recognize that time, this is the time for me to move on. All right. Let's talk about B here. Next, you need to accept the fact that some questions have to go unanswered for now. What usually holds us up in this solidifying process is we hit this place where, you know, I don't know everything about this and I want to know everything about this before I can decide. You're not going to get that luxury on a lot of things. I hate to burst your bubble, but the fact is we can't know everything. What do you need? Well, number one, you need sufficient evidence for conclusion, not exhaustive evidence. You don't get to know everything, but there is sufficient evidence for you to decide. This is what I believe. In the book of Job, which we just studied about in our last class, after Job has said, boy, I wish God would come down and talk to me and I could talk to him as a man. Well, he gets his wish and God comes down and starting in chapter 38, God asks him a bunch of questions that he can't answer. And 38 through chapter 41, basically, God is asking questions. And here is Job's reply in chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? He is actually repeating what God said to him in chapter 38, verse 2. Who is this who keeps asking you know, these questions? Here's his response. Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job saying, I wanted to know all these answers, but after you explained what you just explained to me, God, I can't, I 
can't know all this stuff. But I know enough to know you can do all things. I can decide. I can come down solid on that fact. I have sufficient evidence, not exhaustive evidence. You know, in a court case, if you're on a jury, you're examining the evidence. Do you actually have to have all of the evidence to decide whether a person truly is guilty or not? You know, some people have been convicted and there is no murder weapon has ever been found. Sometimes the body has not even been found. And yet, People can be convicted because there's sufficient evidence that, yes, they committed this crime. In the same way, you can examine the Bible and there is sufficient evidence for you to base your faith on whether the Bible is the Word of God or not. That's what faith is. And if it is, stand on the Word of God. Trust God with your life. Give Him your life. That is what solidifying your faith is is all about. You also need to understand number two, an infinite God is hard for a finite mind to grasp. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you read with me, starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of of the clever, I will set aside. At, right there, Paul is referring back to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. Which that's what that says. Where is the wise man? He asked Ness. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block. And to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul is saying you can take God's most absolutely foolish moment, and of course there is no such a thing. He never makes a, a foolish move or a foolish decision. And that is so much higher than the greatest that man has ever accomplished in wisdom. There's just no comparison. We're trying to grasp an infinite God with finite minds. You're not going to understand that all the way. I don't understand it. Nobody understands that. How can you understand a God who had no beginning ever? He's always existed. In our finite world that we live in, we cannot understand an infinite God. And that's okay. I don't have to know everything about God to know I want to put my trust in Him. A lot of you don't know how your car runs, but you get in it and you drive. You trust it to get you somewhere. Can you not do the same thing with God? You can trust God even though you may not have all of your questions answered. Thirdly, you need to understand there are secret things we don't need to know. You know, we just looked at Job chapter 42, verse 3, and I'll just put it up here on the screen so you can see it again. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. There are things that are too wonderful for us. We just... We can't absorb it. It's just too much. Moses puts it this way in Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. There are secret things and they belong to God. They're His. Or Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. What's that innocent of doves? What's he talking about there? There's some things that, that we should be glad we're innocent about, things we don't need to know about. You don't have to know everything. And I think this is important to understand. If you're going to solidify your faith, you've got to get to that point you understand, I don't have to know everything. I just need sufficient evidence to decide this is what I'm going to believe. 
If you want to have solidifying faith, the third thing you need to do or see in your outline there is pray for a spirit of conviction. Under that, number one, understand this. Half-hearted Christianity is a waste of time. Now, I don't mean to be insulting, but I, I've watched Christians for a long, long time. And some of them, they just go at it half-hearted. And to me, it's such a waste of time. Why do that? You know, why just kind of give it a little bit of effort? You've got just enough religion in your life, you can't enjoy your sin, and just enough sin in your life, you can't enjoy your religion. It's the worst of both worlds. I think that's why Jesus said, I wish you were either hot or cold, because you're lukewarm. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Or he also said in Mark chapter 12, if you look at that verse with me, and this is one I'm, I'm sure you've heard before. Uh, the scene starting in verse 28, it says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, he asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus says you can take all of the commands in the Bible and boil it down to this one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. None of this half-hearted stuff. Give God all of your heart. Pray for that. Pray that God will give you that spirit of conviction that you will be able to solidify your faith so that you can have the mature faith that He desires for you to have. Secondly, understand that those who live for nothing die for nothing. In Colossians chapter 3, we're talking about purpose here. What is the purpose of your life? And this is what Christianity offers to us, the ultimate purpose in life. And the purpose in life is living for Christ. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Paul is, is saying, keep seeking the things above. Stop worrying about the earthly things, these things that are not going to matter in eternity. We spend so much time worried about these worldly things when only one thing matters. And that is our relationship with God. Set your mind on things above, for you died. If you are a Christian right now, your old life is dead, and you are born again. You're given a new life. And when that happens, when we come back to this new life, then we don't come back to the new life to live the old way again. He says, when Christ, who is your life, in verse 4. He doesn't say when Christ, who is your religion, or when Christ, who is your hobby, or when, when Christ, who is just what you do. No, when Christ, who is your life, appears. Is Christ your life? If you live for nothing, you will die for nothing. But if you live for Christ, you're living for everything. Pray that God will give you that spirit of conviction. One third thing before we close. I don't know if you're in the habit of doing this, but I would recommend you get in the, in the habit of writing your prayers down. This will help to solidify your faith in an amazing way. Write your prayers down so you can see how they're being answered. I got a call just last night from a, a mother that I, I've known for many years. I know all her kids. Uh, we used to go to church with them. She says, my daughter, who's now graduated from college, is struggling with, does God really answer prayer? They had prayed for somebody that was uh, suffering and was dying, and they died. And they feel like, well, you know, God never answered my prayers. God does answer prayers, but you have to understand how to pray and you have to understand how He answers prayers. And so if you'll get in the habit of writing down your prayers and just study your own prayer life, you'll learn a lot about how your faith works, how God answers prayer, and how faith and prayer work together. You can't really separate the two. Your, your prayer and having a strong, strong prayer life is based on having a strong faith. 
Pray for that spirit of conviction. That's how you're going to solidify your faith. A lot more I could teach you, but I think that will get you started in the right direction. I'm going to stop there, and in our next class, we're going to talk about up again, down again faith. Now, this is a favorite of mine, and it's usually a favorite of uh, students that I've had in the past. Uh, they usually come back and say, man, I really like this. We can relate to this so much. Do you have up again, down again faith? Is your faith just high highs and low lows? Well, we're going to talk about, first of all, examples in the Bible, and then I'm going to show you how to smooth those out and how to get rid of that bumpy up again, down again faith. Look forward to seeing you next time.